unpack the roots of this violence, its insidious forms, and what we can all do to promote the rights and safety of trans and gender expansive community members. Before we start the discussion, uh, we will first hear briefly from Saloni Sethi, First Deputy Commissioner of the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence. Thanks, Melanie. Um, so hi, everyone. As Melanie said, I'm Saloni Sethi. I use your they pronouns. I'm the First Deputy Commissioner of the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, or NGBV. Um, so NGBV's role is really coordinating the city's response to domestic and gender-based violence through policy and program development. Uh, we do both sort of interventive programs for stuff that happens, you know, programs that, that work after violence has happened, as well as prevention programs uh, that try to prevent violence in the first place. Some of the services uh, that we provide through community-based partnerships um, with community-based organizations and through our family justice centers include counseling, case management, civil legal services like family and immigration services, um, and support with system navigation and advocacy broadly, right, which includes support navigating housing, housing access and housing systems, or shelter systems, public benefits, school systems, criminal legal systems, really all of the above, um, that we really can offer connections to make sure that you have people that will support you through these processes, which can be challenging and harmful to, to so many folks, right, uh, especially folks that are, that are trans and gender expansive. Um, so I think for for this group, what what I'd really want people to say and uh, to know, and what I really want to say to you, to you all is that when our office thinks of gender based violence, um, and this is sort of a, a more recent change for us, we expanded in twenty eighteen to really take on all issues of gender based violence. We really um, are taking a broad approach that looks at violence as a spectrum, right? One that begins with dehumanization and discrimination and and escalates from there to include things like harassment and and abuse. So anyone that has experienced any form of violence or harm based on gender identity or gender expression may be eligible for our supports. Um, so I think I really wanna encourage you as we think of, have this conversation and think about solutions to think about our office and think about how we can uh, be there to, to help you either with your individual challenges and issues or kind of with broader policy and systemic changes. Um, and thank you all so much for being here to have this, this talk today. Thank you so much, Saloni. Um... So we are joined today by four panelists with deep knowledge and expertise on these issues. Uh, first, we have Amara Jones, she, her, hers pronouns, uh, the founder and CEO of Translash Media and a CGE commissioner. Translash Media is a nonprofit journalism and narrative organization working to shift the, the current culture of hostility towards transgender people in the US. Her work has won Emmy and Peabody Awards, and in 2020, she was featured on the cover of Time Magazine. So, Amara, you can go ahead and turn your camera on. We also have with us today Jasmine Lopez Phelan, she, her, hers pronouns, who is the TGNCNB Health Project Coordinator at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, where she supports the Division of Disease Control's efforts to promote the health of TGNCNB New Yorkers. She has dedicated her career to uplifting and advancing the needs of New York City's LGBTQ plus community in the areas of HIV prevention, support, economic empowerment and justice, capacity building, and TGNC and B health research. And Jasmine, you can go ahead and turn on your video. We are also joined today by Kiara St. James, she, her, hers pronouns, the founder and executive director of the New York Transgender Advocacy Group, or NITAG, and a CGE commissioner. NITAG is a grassroots trans-led nonprofit organization intent on creating new opportunities for the trans community. Kiara is a longtime organizer and has led the fight for affirming policies like New York's gender law preventing discrimination based on gender identity and educated many about the experiences of trans folks and other communities historically pushed to the margins. And you can go ahead and turn on your video. And then we also have Brent Whitfield, he, him, his pronouns, the director of LGBTQI affairs at the New York City Department of Social Services, where he works to increase awareness and visibility of LGBTQI issues across the agencies, um, including Department of Homeless Services and the Human Resources Administration. And he works to identify obstacles to accessing services and programs, working directly with program participants, community and advocates to improve policy and procedures. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, so we're going to get started right now into our first question, which is that 
We know that transgender and gender expansive individuals face high rates of gender-based violence and that trans women of color face even higher rates of gender-based violence. According to the Human Rights Campaign, 63% of victims of fatal violence against trans and gender expansive people are Black trans women. What are some of the root causes of gender-based violence against transgender and gender expansive communities, and why is it important for us to look at this issue through an intersectional lens? Um, I'd like to maybe ask Kiara to start us off with that question. Yes, um, thank you so much, Melanie, and I'm so proud to be, be, be among some esteemed panelists today. Um, I definitely, you know, I'm always reflecting upon New York City and how people always like to see New York City as a um, hub of progress, which we are to many degrees. But also, I have to remind folks that since 2020, we have lost 12 trans. 12 trans women of color, nine um, black trans women and um, three trans Latina in New York City. And there was really not, a, not enough coverage or any coverage of these, these murders in New York City. So we still continue to seek visibility when it comes to um, finding the perpetrators of these crimes. Um, I definitely feel like one of the things I feel is important for all of us to do is to decolonize our minds and how we see the trans community, gender non-conforming and gender non-binary people. Um, it's really important. I I love history, so one of the things I always try to you know establish some type of historical content of how did we get here. And you know when you look at the global world and um, before it was colonized, there were always indigenous trans, not, not having to name trans, of course. Um, I think like if you look at India, South Asia, um, the, the Hedras, um, the Katois in Thailand, um, the Fafa Themis in the Polynesian culture that still exists, like in Hawaii, um, in Africa, they have different tribes for um, feminine men or um, trans, trans women. Once again, we didn't have the term trans back then. And what happened was when white um, men colonized the world, to them, all of this was queer to them, it was strange, right? It was strange to them. And so what they created was a pathology and they created, um, they criminalized um, those who were different um, gender variants. And so we have to understand that our first fight is to really decolonize how we look and see ourselves. Um, even as trans people, we have to decolonize our minds because you know you can be trans and transphobic as well, right? Just like you can be black and anti-black. So it's really important for us to decolonize our minds and educate, um, um, know that history, know that important history that is not being taught in our school system for a reason. Um, the other thing that I, I think is really important and it's connected to history is making sure that um, we do, we touch bases with faith-based leaders, getting them involved in this conversation, getting them involved in uplifting and um, affirming the TGNC community. That's really essential. As I said, we've lost 12 trans women of color in New York City and the silence was, was, was deafening. And so it's the responsibility of all of us to make sure that when we hear or see any type of uh, form of this um, transphobia that we speak out. And there's um, several like hotlines you can um, um, reach out and I'll have that later on, um, you know, like trans hotline to report any type of transphobia that you've witnessed. But I really feel that it's important for all of us to understand that we have to reimagine how we wanna move forward um, in 2023, moving forward, 2024, 10 years, 20 years from now, how do we want to move forward? And the best way to move forward is to be inclusive and affirming of all genders. Thank you so much, Kiara. That was very powerful. I'd love to open it up to the rest of the panel. Does anyone um, else want to speak to Kiara's comments or you know, the need to, to look at this issue intersectionally? Please go ahead, Brent. Yes, I, I, 
you know, um, affirming everything that Kiara stated, but also I think that when we look at gender norms and, and that rigid idea of what gender is supposed to look like, women are supposed to look a certain way, um, which not just affects um, trans and gender expressive, gender expansive individuals, but also cisgender black individuals, and particularly black women. Um, you know, we have black women that have been assaulted or killed because people assumed they were trans. And, you know, and while trans women are certainly um, disproportionately affected by the violence, trans men are sort of invisible. And so when you go into the communities and you see if you don't sort of quote unquote um, look masculine enough or pass enough, trans men are attacked. And, but we don't have those, we don't have the statistics to that and people aren't looking at that you, you have. So I think that it's those rigid ideas of what a person is supposed to look like, regardless of what a person's actual gender identity is. It's what people believe, how you're supposed to look, how you're supposed to dress, how you're supposed to walk, how you're supposed to talk. And I think we really need to break this down and understand how this causes so much harm, not just for trans individuals or trans expansive individuals, but for cisgender individuals. Absolutely. Thank you so much. The, the issue of rigid gender norms definitely affects, affects everyone, no matter how they identify. Jasmine or Imara? Sure, I'm happy to jump in. Um, Melanie, that was an amazing question. Um, and to affirm, you know, my fellow peers and leaders, Kiara and Brent, um, we also have to look at the social determinants of health, right? Which include like the social and community context, you know, the neighborhood and built environment within our, you know, where our community members live, um, healthcare access, education access and quality, and also economic stability. I think that the social and community context is really one of the root causes of gender-based violence and violence toward our communities, because that really informs, you know, what are the experiences and how folks experience safety and lack of safety in different environments. It you know, really affects how folks access, you know, quality healthcare or affirming healthcare, and even their experiences within the educational system, you know, really beginning from elementary school, all the way, you know, through college and university. And it also really impacts economic stability, you know, you know, because that social and community context can affect, you know, where folks are hired, if they're even hired at all, you know, whether or not they have to go into alternative or survival economies, which then create this other context, like on both an individual level and a community level, right? It helps, unfortunately, create stereotypes. It perpetuates those stereotypes. And then those then lead to like different forms of violence for our community. Thank you, Jasmine. Amara, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I think that for me, I think we have to understand that um, kind of as everyone has touched upon, violence is something <clears throat> that we choose to expose people to or not. And that we do that through the policies that we enact. And we know from research, um, I wrote a piece about this a couple of years ago, we know from research that the more exposed economically you are, the more marginalized you are, um, the more likely you are to be exposed to violence. Which means that if we want to end violence, we have to ensure economic security, we have to ensure housing security, we have to ensure educational opportunities, and we have to ensure, um, as Jasmine said, um, health opportunities, right? And, and that's not esoteric, right? Those are not only things about changing the social frame in which we see gender. Those are all policy choices within the power of decision makers. So I think that we need to make sure that we underscore that there is something that we can do about the violence against um, trans people, and that's to um, essentially demarginalize trans people in some pretty powerful and substantial ways through policy and through the choices of decision makers. I also think that 
it's also really important that um, we underscore that one of the intersections for not taking um, trans lives seriously, um, as uh, Kiara kind of led us off in, is the fact that um, people don't believe that violence against us is actually counts as violence. And I think that another thing that can be um, communicated is that trans lives specifically in the context that we're talking about in New York and violence, that black and brown trans lives are equal to others, right? And that violence against um, our community is something that is taken very seriously um, as it is across all communities. So again, I think that it's just important for us to make sure that we understand that through a series of choices that we make is why trans people are more exposed to violence. Absolutely. Thank you all so much. And you know, this next question touches on something we've you've all mentioned already, which is the the power of policy to affect people's lives and the degree to which they experience violence. So this next question that I wanted to ask um, has to do with structural and institutional forms of violence. So as we've seen, there have been so many anti-LGBTQ plus bills across the country this year. Um, in addition to legislation, um, what are some other ways that structures and institutions can target and harm trans and gender expansive communities so that we can all be more aware and work to address these issues? And Jasmine, you touched on this a little bit already, um, but I'd love to turn to you to hear a little bit more. Yes, thank you, Melanie. Um, excellent question. Um, again, um, I can focus to begin like on two um kind of forms of institutional violence, um, particularly around healthcare restrictions. Um, I know that there have been there has been a lot of legislation, you know, working to you know strongly limit or severely limit the access that TGNCMB young people right have to gender affirming care and also these different ramifications for providers that facilitate gender affirming care and that really is one of the ways that this institutional violence is perpetuated because it not only you know makes it hard for our community members to access care but it also punishes those who are you know kind of honoring the oath right to do no harm to be able to provide you know competent affirming health care to our community members and it also breaks down the health infrastructure of the community as a whole. Because if you punish providers for facilitating care, then you potentially can create these sort of like deserts of healthcare where then the whole community is affected. Because now if you have one provider in a region and they're no longer able to practice, because you know they were facilitating gender affirming care. Now everyone in that region potentially is facing a healthcare disparity. You know, um, another form of institutional violence includes like the legal recognition of gender identity. There are a lot of you know places in our country who are very resistant to affirming you know our community members you know through their identity documents, through you know their work you know, their educational spaces. And that really affects how people can show up in these different spaces and are able to thrive. And that can, you know, contribute to like the limiting of them be able, being able to like have a sustainable life, to be able to have economic stability and to also be able to, you know, excel in life in all of the different areas that we know our community members can. Absolutely. Does anyone else want to jump in? Uh, certainly. Um, I think that, you know, that there's also, when you look at housing, that particularly when you put the intersectionality of being Black and trans, Black trans people are four times as likely to be unemployed, five times as likely to experience homelessness. Um, we are all assigned a sex and gender at birth, and I think that locks individuals in. And so as individuals grow um, and become adults, that when you look at applying for jobs, applying for housing, applying for school, a lot of those institutions don't allow individuals to self-identify. They don't allow individuals. So that really creates an issue. So if I, you know, and just touching on what Jasmine said about healthcare, if I don't have a job, I don't have healthcare. And then when I go to these systems, 
to apply for healthcare, say Medicaid, they are locking me in to an identity that is not my, mine. Um, and I don't have the documentations to actually be able. So we're really creating barriers where barriers shouldn't exist. And, and those are policy choices. Those are policy choices. It's not something that has to be there. Um, and so if we remove that, and and those are you know remove all those barriers. We can actually create a system, or work within the system to be until we can. Well, let me not just say get rid of the system, but <laughs> I don't want to say that. Um, but we can actually create a system that is actually more affirming, and allow individuals to self-identify, affirm individuals where people don't feel afraid to be able to go. You know, I have a cousin that's in Alabama. They can't get their what they need due to policy and that shouldn't be they were going to their primary care physician um to get hormone replacement therapy and and had never been to the doctors that they should go to and that honestly is a is really a policy issue it is really giving access and those are the things that we need to really be looking at how are we allowing individuals to safely access health care to safely access housing, safely go to their jobs. And those are things that we really need to look at. I mean, they're, they're policies that we put into place that sort of make things unsafe. Thank you so much, Brent. Um, Kiara, it sounds like you want to add something. Yeah, no, thank you. The word I was thinking when you was talking, Brent, is we, we want to repurpose the system. We want to, you know, have it work in our favor. Um, I, I'm going to also this um, a person, something that happened to me personally um, in the late 90s um, is I found myself being homeless with some other um, black and brown queer folks. Um, and we went to um, Salvation Army because we heard that they were going to give out um, clothes and coats as well as feed us. And when we were, we was in a line, the line was like all, all the way around the corner. So, so we was in the line a long time. So by the time we got to the, the entrance of the door to uh, get our ticket to go inside, we were told that um, they could not serve us, right? Because um, our attire. And so we're like, what do you mean our attire? Like, this is how we dress every day, you know? So it, it became a thing where um, people's personal bias prevented me and my friends from having access to a meal that day, having access to a coat, right? And um, I, I think about that still to this day when I when I pass Salvation Army. It's like, yeah, they they discriminated against me. But the other thing that comes to mind is we just did a, a, a prep panel a few weeks ago at the center. And there was um, a person on the panel who talked about wanting to um, get on prep and get other affirming services. And so she was sent to a church, right? She was sent to a church in order to qualify for prep and affirming services in Atlanta, Georgia. And so it still speaks to how people's personal um, biases gets, gets in the way of them helping people who are really in need, um, you know, uh, in this case, trans folks. And so there still needs to, that's why I'm really, I'm, I always try to stress, we have to educate our faith-based leaders um, because so many of our community members are, are very spiritual, are still very caught up um, in, in their faith, you know, especially if they're black or, or Latina. Um, so it's really important for us to work with faith-based leaders so that they can see us as human beings, um, you know, but I, I do feel like, um, as folks were saying earlier, the best way that we have, we um, should be moving forward is to address this by making sure that we have affirming policies um, in New York City and New York State. And I know that, um, I think it was in 2015, New York City has a, um, a penalty for people who intentionally um, misgenders um, um, trans folks or gender nonconforming folks. And so those are the best ways that we're going to be able to fight back because people may not care about the laws, but they do care about how it impacts 
their pockets, their bottom line. And so one of the um, things we're gonna have to do is really educate our community. And if these things are happening to you, here are the recourse. These are the recourse that you can take in making sure that you um, that you are not discriminated against. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, th the ways that these systems can harm are pretty apparent, I think. And I think that the key way that they harm is by not taking the needs of trans people seriously when you're formulating policy and policy decisions and communicating that. Um, that's automatic harm. Um, because if a group is marginalized and they're not considered to be a part of what you are already executing or solving for, you're compounding marginalization and doing harm and committing violence, right? It's it's pretty, it's a very straightforward kind of formulation. Um, I think on the flip side, though, if you want to look at what are the things that organizations and policymakers could do, I think we need some pretty radical thinking about how to help transform the lives of trans people. I think that we're gonna talk about this later. I know that um, Kiara has thoughts about this and has worked with policymakers on pushing this idea forward, but um, you know, a UBI would be um, tremendously um, transformative for the lives of trans people. We need to think about radical ways to center um, trans people in the hiring of the city and state agencies, which is um, massive and, and really important. Also thinking about um, how to center trans people in some of the trans, um, I'm sorry, into some of the small business incubators that the city has um, and the grant making that the city does. So there are lots of ways that we can move forward. It's just a matter of focus and of will. Um, and I think that that's actually the missing ingredient here, right? Um, and I think that one of the things that we um, think of in New York City is that as long as we're not doing, as long as our government isn't doing active harm, that somehow we are tremendously better than other places. And I think that that's the wrong bar. I think that the bar has to be that unless and until um, you know the city is taking um, strong positive actions to reverse the compounded harm, um, then we are not doing enough, and we shouldn't be so self congratulatory. And of course, um, you know where trans people are accepted or have opportunities is highly dependent upon where they live in the city, right? Um, and not to mention New York State overall. So I think that you know we have a lot of work to do, and um, the we shouldn't be too self congratulatory that because um, there is an active harm that because you know Kiara um, and I, for example, and one other trans woman are all on the the Commission on Gender Equity and other um, commissions across the city that we are we are doing what we can. Um, that's 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 just not the case. I'm I'm really glad you brought that up, Imara, because it, it does bring us to our, our next question. And uh, some folks have already mentioned places like Alabama or Atlanta. Um, you know, we are all here in New York City. And, and like you said, there's still a lot more that we can do, Amara. But I do want to take a moment to talk a little bit about what New York City is doing um, and talk about some of the policies and programs that do currently exist to protect and support trans and gender expansive communities, which include specialized housing services, capacity building grants for trans led organizations, and gender affirming care at public hospitals and clinics. And, you know, first, I want to turn to my city colleagues, um, Brent and Jasmine, and ask them to talk a little bit about the work that they are doing. Um, so Brent, why don't we hear from you first? Uh, certainly. So um, at the New York City Department of Homeless Services, there is an understanding that the space, homeless services was not a safe space for trans individuals. Um, and trans people were actually deciding to sleep in staircases, sleep on the subways, in the parks. Um, they were trading sex for a safe place to sleep rather than go into our shelters, which is horrific. Um, and we, you know, 
Administrator Carter had been looking at this for a very long time, um, but it was accelerated by a lawsuit, um, Lopez v. New York, um, where we had previously created one space for, we had a provider that created a, what we call trans carve out, a TGNC NBI carve out, which are spaces um, in, within our standalone shelters um, because our shelters weren't built um, were built to be sort of binary. Um, people weren't thinking about trans and trans expansive individuals. So our first shelter was in the Bronx. Um, it was in a standalone men's shelter that came about in late 2019, early 2020. And then we created four more spaces. These spaces are for our TGNC NBI individuals um, who self-identify. So individuals don't have to show documentation. Um, individuals, no one can question whether or not someone, how they identify. Um, and these spaces are either um, co-located on a floor with other individuals, but on a separate wing, they have either the bathrooms are located co inside the units or the bathroom is specific for TGNC, NBI individuals, because a lot of the violence that happens to trans individuals while in shelter, whether it be from shelter residents or staff, or so I wanna be clear that even our staff members can be transphobic and attacks to our trans clients. So that what we did was we said, hey, these bathrooms are specific. So our trans clients feel comfortable. TGNC, NBI individuals should feel comfortable in our shelters. They should feel safe. So we have those shelter spaces. Um, also, we have expedited placement. Individuals who go in, they go in, they have to go through the medical, they have to give all of their information, and then they do not have to wait for assessment. They don't have to go to the men's or the women's assessment. They can go directly to their placement and the placement and the shelter will do the assessment from there also creating safety. Um, also, if say right now, um, due to capacity, all of our TGNC beds are filled. So we have low, we, we individuals come in, we look for low capacity. So we're not placing individuals in large spaces um, because it's single adults. We do, it is a co you know, it is a large sort of dorms for some, for some spaces. So we wanna ensure that people feel safe, they feel secure, and we place them on a waiting list so individuals can go to the spaces they feel most secure in. Um, also, all of our staff, every staff member that has access to clients, regardless to whether they're TGNC, or they self-identified as TGNC or not, all of our staff have to be trained in a TGNC NBI training. This includes security, Anyone who supervises someone who is has access to clients, this includes if you if you know the kitchen staff who also interact, and individuals at DHS also have to sign a non discrimination form, and we look at that. So if your staff has signed this non discrimination form, and the union said, okay, good, now we can now look at next steps because as we know, policy is all and procedures only as good as like we have you know, there's the carrot and then there's the stick. So now we also have to look at what happens if individuals intentionally continue to do the thing that we're asking them not to do. And so these are the things that we're going at. And also what I have done is I have offered my services. I'm a one man shop, but I've offered my services. I am going in, I am working and speaking with actually next week, in the next two weeks, speaking with our TGNC clients and the carve outs to see how these carve outs are actually working. What, are, what, what is good, what is bad, what do we need to change and working with the staff. So that staff understand what, how to effectively and, and work with our clients and be affirming. So, because for my thing is, I don't want TGNC clients to be seen as different. I want individuals to understand that we are, we're not a minority, we're not sort of an other, we are part of the population and we need to be treated fairly and equally. And what we're providing right now is equity because that's not what was happening. So that's what we have. And then right now I'm working with HRA for the DV shelters to affirm that system. What does it look like? 
why are people being um, sent away and how and really working with individuals who identify as TGNC and BI who are impacted by int intimate partner violence and domestic violence and how are we helping them and are we really being truly being affirming as a system so that's what we're that's where we're at right now thank you so much Brent that that's so much and I appreciate that you're a one-man shop doing all of this um Jasmine, can we hear a little bit uh, about the work that you're doing at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene? Yeah, absolutely. And Brent, I'm so excited about all of the work that um, you're doing. I would I would like to explore opportunities for collaboration. Um, but with that being said, um, yeah, so here at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, I mean, obviously we, you know, our overall mission is to promote the health of all New Yorkers and, you know, obviously TGMC and B New Yorkers, you know, are part of our community. And as part of the LGBTQ health projects team, you know, we operate operationalize that um, in a couple of ways. Um, so we have our transgender, gender non-conforming and non-binary community advisory board. Um, so you know, the purpose of that board is to provide, you know, guidance and feedback specifically to the Division of Disease Control um, on different programs, you know, initiatives, uh, different campaigns um, that are meant, you know, to directly benefit our TGNCMB uh, New Yorkers. I also want to talk about a little bit about the impact that, you know, the different pieces of programming has on both our work and the community at large. So, you know, community members that are part of our TGNCMB advisory board, you know, if, it's really an empowering experience because TGNCMB community members are able to, you know, participate in conversations with government, right, around community health promotion and really how can we leverage that, how can we elevate that and really make it the best that we can. Um, you know, we also have, you know, community health information bulletins, um, which you know, specifically are meant to provide guidance, right, to providers, you know, that see our TGNCMB patients. But, you know, the impact of that is also to make sure that any provider in the city is well equipped, right, and has the knowledge to provide TGNCMB, you know, gender affirming care so that gender affirming care doesn't have to live in just kind of very specific pockets or specific agencies. You know, um, we have a specific TGNCMB, you know, community you know, city health information bulletin, but we also have, you know, an MSM one, a WSW one, because we also know that TGNCMB community members make part of those communities as well. Uh, you know, we have um, employee resource groups, you know, I'm part of the LGBTQ um, employee resource group, and I'm also the chair of our TGNCMB workplace inclusion committee. Um, and, you know, that in itself, like it provides not only opportunities for leadership, like TGNCMB, you know, for TGNCMB people like myself, but it also brings in other, you know, administrative staff, leadership staff to be able to have conversations on how can we make our workplace, you know, safe and affirming and create an environment that allows TGNCMB staff members to thrive and to be able to resource share among one another, um, to be able to demystify, you know, certain policies that might, you know, inadvertently, you know, oppress our community members so that, you know, folks can feel better about adhering to those policies or navigating those policies. Uh, we have our TGNCMB health web pages, you know, for example, that also provide, you know, affirming, you know, um, health information and resources. We have this is the part that I'm actually most excited about. We have um, our new TGNCMB healthcare booklet. You know, it's called Pride and Care. Um, and, you know, it's available in multiple languages. It's currently available, you know, on our TGNCMB webpage. It will soon be available, you know, in hard copy, but it's also another resource that we can provide community. It's something that is easy, you know, it's digestible, it's applicable, you know, to many community members across the gender affirmation journey. Um, and it's also fun in the sense that, you know, we use illustrations because we want to have as many TGNCMB community members, you know, be able to see themselves, right, in health information products as well. So that's really important to us. Um, you know, we also have our LGBTQ Healthcare Bill of Rights, which, you know, it's a, it's a very powerful document in the sense that it, it allows people to have, you know, their rights on hand because we do offer it like in big posters and also wallet cards. 
Um, but it really provides folks the tools like, hey, these are your rights. And it can also be a really great tool to encourage like self-advocacy in different, you know, healthcare settings when accessing different services. Um, yeah, it's so, you know, I'm really proud of the work that we do. Um, and most recently, you know, we've really upped our commemoration of Trans Day of Remembrance. So we had an inaugural, you know, Trans Day of Remembrance event where folks were able, well, t uh, staff members at the agency were able to, you know, provide, uh, you know, like loving messages of support and affirmation, you know, to the folks that we have lost so far, unfortunately, in 2023. So it's really creating this culture of, you know, we're only, we're only as good, our support to our community is only as good as the support that we offer our staff and all of those that are doing the work with us. You know, being able to increase the knowledge and awareness of the work that our team does to like say, to have other staff members be able to say, you know what, this is a really great program. This is a really great initiative and I wanna be part of it and support it. So that's in a nutshell what, you know, the health department is doing. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And we're certainly going to be sure to share with all the people um, watching today some of those resources so that people can um, take advantage of, of some of those programs and services that already exist. And I know um, Amara spoke a little bit already about you know what else the city should be trying to do to make a positive impact in the lives of trans and gender expansive New Yorkers. So I'd like to ask um, you, Kiar, maybe if you wanna speak very briefly about what are some other things that the city should think about doing? So, yeah, I definitely am a strong believer in that we have to address the root causes of um, transphobia, the root causes of, of poverty that um, so many black and brown TGNC folks are facing. Um, you know, so I've been in conversations with um, quite a few policymakers as well as elected officials in, in regards to how we change um, these programs for like welfare, section eight, um, to where if folks are on, if folks are receiving welfare, they can be penalized if um, it's found out that they are saving money. But the reality is we should be encouraging our community to save money so that they can move out of shelters, residential houses into uh, more permanent um, houses, um, maybe not in New York City, maybe in the suburbs. Um, and so that is um, one of the things I'm gonna be pushing for um, next year in conversation is we must change the policies. This perpetuation of um, that black and brown folks are irresponsible and that's why we're always in poverty is not true. It's the system that is in place. We must dismantle that system and create it in a way that it affirms all of us and that so that all of us are have the opportunity to improve our quality of life. Um, along with changing um, those type of requirements um, in regards to welfare um, and things of that nature, I really feel that it's important for us to really um, do more work in getting um, educating our community as well as elected officials around universal basic income as Amara um, um, talked about a little bit earlier. Because the reality is that we are going to see that uh, a lot of the jobs, traditional jobs that, um, that we had or that I had when I was a kid, when I was a teenager working at McDonald's and uh, working at Jack in the Box, I'm from Texas. So um, that those things, are going to be more automated now. And so we need to really reimagine how we want to improve um, TGNC folks' life in a way that is sustainable. So universal basic income is one of those ways that we, we can do that, where folks are able to really um, be able to ha have access to housing. Because as we know, housing is the foundation. Housing is a foundation for you to really start deciding what you want to do with your life. You know, you, you can't really think about going to school or, you know, certain type of medications. It requires you to be permanently housed. So we have to think of ways to, to invest in equity, equitable programs. Um, the mayor um, um, created the Unity um, um, Project, which 
came out of a, a, a conversation that I and several other black and brown trans women, trans women and men had with him um, at um, City Hall um, when he first um, came into office, where you know I talked about we in the black and brown community are tired of being tethered to white queer spaces where we only get crumbs from the table. And so the reality is equity, equity is what we must be fighting for more of. Um, I think it's great that he created the Unity um, um, Pride um, Equity um, Fund, but as we know, this is New York City. That simply is not going to be enough. But one of the things that I, I can say that we also have in our favor, um, thanks to a lot of other trans activists, such as Elisa Crespo, um, is our Lorena Borjas Wellness and Equity Fund. That's, that, is, that makes New York the second state after California to have legislation that is specific to the trans community of New York State, not just New York City. But New York State, and I believe currently we um, um, we're going to be looking at four million dollars in funding in that particular pot. So one of the things I just cannot stress enough is equity, equity, equity. We must continue to fight for that. Absolutely, thank you so much. And um, I think we're going to talk a little bit later about you know some of the policy, some of the actions that people can take to support this work. But I want to switch gears a little bit. And we've talked a lot about policy and, and institutional structures. I want to talk a little bit about rhetoric. So pervasive anti-trans rhetoric and disinformation um, has, has really been prevalent across the U.S. And we know it plays a role in systemic gender-based violence, particularly against trans and gender expansive communities. Um, I'd love to ask, how do you think gender-based violence is perpetuated through disinformation and what can we do to combat disinformation and anti-trans rhetoric? And I think, Amara, you're the, the perfect person to maybe lead on, on talking about this issue. Yes, uh, this is what I get paid to do. Um, so um, one of the things I think that we have to understand is that there's nothing that um, when it comes to the way that we are talking about trans people and specifically trans youth at this moment, that is an accident. There's nothing about that conversation that is currently organic. So that when you hear questions um, or people that you know around you who normally would be, um, you know, left leaning or consider themselves progressive say things like, I support trans, trans adults are fine, but you know, I really don't know about trans kids or can they really be making decisions? Or, you know, they're just giving out like, you know, hormones left and right at, at school to anyone who says that they're trans. Like all of those, types of ideas and conversation starters are actually the result of a very sophisticated um, disinformation campaign that is coordinated by the Christian nationalist movement. That all of those messages of questioning the validity of trans kids, which then make it much easier to question the validity of trans people, is an approach that they poll tested um, about eight or nine years ago and workshopped and refined, and then have worked really hard to seed kind of those questions across um, the internet in ways uh, that seem to be organic, but they're not. And those messages are then picked up by um, uh, right-wing media, and then ultimately as well um, by mainstream sources like the New York Times, which is increasingly laundering those ideas. So I think that we have to understand that the very way that we talk about trans people and have that understanding right now is the result of disinformation. And so I tell people that the minute you hear someone say something that's questioning the validity of trans kids or, um, or whether or not we should be affirming them with respect to gender, um, I immediately let people know that even that question is the result of disinformation and what makes disinformation extremely effective is that it doesn't seem like it's disinformation. It presents itself as legitimate questions or it presents itself as skepticism 
or it presents itself as um, as just trying to learn more. That doesn't mean that those are legit, aren't legitimate things, but it's the way that they're applied to trans people right now that's the result of disinformation. And what that conversation has done that they've um, created is that it's then legitimized the undermining of rights for both trans kids and trans people overall. It creates the rationale to ban gender affirming care. It, um, it uh, creates the rationale to prevent people from, as a new um, law by Senator, or a new bill sponsored by Senator Ted Cruz at the federal level, um, would prevent people from um, using the pronoun that is aligned with their gender and insist on them using the pronoun that's assigned at birth, for example. Um, and so this is the way that the disinformation campaign, this rhetoric campaign works in tandem with a legislative and policy agenda. And that's why you can't divorce them, right? You have to see them as being a part of a unitary effort. And so I think that we have to understand that. And the reason why is because they understand that this conversation allows them to speak to people that they would never be in, co in conversation with. It allows them to speak to suburban parents. It allows them to speak to, you know, intellectuals who see themselves as Democrats, right? It allows them to create these conversations with people that they would never ever have access to by using skepticism and questioning of gender and gender identity around that. So we have to understand how the language that we're using, the policies that are being put forth are the result of a very intelligent, I mean, I say that without judgment, but a very intelligent um, political project and um, in the country. And the way that I know all of this is that I've spent the last three years of my life working very hard to understand how these movements work. And you can sort of listen to uh, what is it, nine hours of, 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 of more of what I have to say about this across a, uh, a podcast that we have called the Anti-Trans um, Hate Machine, A Plot Against Equality. But I think that we have to understand that right now, the very rhetoric that we're using is, is poison. It also allows them to create dialogue, for example, with Black churches um, uh, that they would never, again, have the same amount of access to. So I think that we have to understand that there's a very sophisticated political operation that is designed to undermine um, democratic politics and then small d democracy by creating a, a disinformation campaign that is fueling the way that we talk about trans people and thus what the policy response is. Thank you so much for enlightening us as to those issues, Imara. I'm very mindful of time, so I do wanna move to our last question. Um, which is, I think, a great segue to what you were just talking about, which is what should allies be doing to combat gender-based violence against trans and gender expansive communities? What resources are available for allies to learn more and become more involved in advocating for transgender rights and safety? I know that, Imara, you just mentioned the podcast, but um, and I'll, I'll give everyone an opportunity to share. Maybe we can start with, um, with Kiara and sort of going around Robin. Yeah, so I, I definitely, um, I like using the word accomplice. And um, I, I really feel that, um, and it's kind of touching upon what Amara said as well, that we have to understand um, how the opposition work is they plan 50 years in advance, right? They plan for the next 50 years where we, you know, the progressive, we tend to be more reactionary. So we have to do a better job of, of, of um, having a strategy to to really um, have that counter narrative already established when they come at us with their transphobic rhetoric. Um, with some of the things that I feel that um, accomplices should be doing is, you know, there's a lot of trans-led organizations in, in New York City, black and brown specifically, black and brown trans-led organizations. So one of the best things you can do as an accomplice is donate, donate, donate. As I said before, equity, like the work that we do, it, 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 it requires for us to have funding to do it. And so when we um, get um, um, concerned citizens involved in donating, volunteering um, their time, 
we're able to really um, mobilize our community um, a lot better. Um, I think also it's just really important for um, our accomplices to really educate yourself enough to where you're in these spaces where we are not, because we are not a large, you know, we're, people might think we're everywhere, but we're really not, right? We're just in people's mind. People are have a fixation with the trans community for some reason. And so it's the responsibility of our accomplices to educate them, educate them on why we have a right to exist, why we have a right to take care of our family, um, use the bathroom. Like those things are really important that um, our accomplices are, are, are doing that work for us when we're not able to speak for ourselves or when it may be too dangerous for us to speak um, for ourselves. And so those are ways that um, our accomplices can really um, be in solidarity with us is um, just being able to uplift a positive message about the trans community, even when we're not there. Thank you so much. Does anyone have anything else they want to add? Uh, yeah, I can I can jump in, Melanie. Um, I think that in terms of allyship, I think what allies can do really is recognizing that allyship is honestly like a lifelong process, um, especially if you're committed to being an ally, um, just recognizing that it's a very dynamic, evolving process and that it can really manifest in different ways. You know, allyship can mean, you know, standing up for someone whether or not someone is watching, right? You know, understanding that, you know, violence toward our community, like doesn't just impact our community, but it impacts everyone. It, it really breaks down, you know, the safety of a community, you know, it creates trauma within the community, but it also lights a fire, you know, um, you know, for folks to really kind of commit to creating this sustainable change and creating these positive, you know, life experiences for our community. Um, but also to recognize that allyship can also be the work that you do. You know, it can be how you show up in different spaces, the spaces that you create. You know, um, our team is creating, you know, a TGNCMB Health Summit, you know, for the spring to help bridge that divide between, you know, our community members and government, because we know that it's there, you know, and we're always constantly trying to bridge it. Um, so that's um, that's something I'm really excited about. And I think it would be a really great demonstration of allyship. So just understanding that it's not something that you are, it's something that you do. Absolutely. I think I've heard you say before that, you know, to be an ally. An ally is a verb and a noun. Mm -hmm. so, um, Brent or Imara? Uh, yeah, I, you know, I think that for me um, to be to normalize and humanize trans individuals that I think part of the disinformation is the dehumanization of trans people. So yeah, you never hear someone say when they do the disinformation, trans people, they just say transgender. And when you remove the people, you dehumanize individuals. And you, you know, and I, it sort of makes me think back to looking at integration and how a lot of individuals had issues with integration because they didn't want to normalize the fact that Black people were human. And if their kids were around Black people, then they would become normal. It, that would, integration would become normal and Black people would become human. And I think that's the same thing when we look at trans individuals. When I do my trainings and, we t and the bathroom is always a big issue. And I do ask that question, what should you do if you see someone in the bathroom that you personally believe shouldn't be there? And I actually had someone respond, I would drag them out. And I said, actually, you're committing a crime. I said, this is, you know, this is not what you do. And I said, well, if you saw me in the bathroom, would you drag me out? I'm a trans man. Would you drag me out? And they were like, and so I think what that does is it humanizes trans individuals. Are you going to drag me out? I mean, like I'm standing before you as a person. And they was like, no. And then at the end, they came and said, I apologize. I honestly did not know. I thought that's what I was supposed to do, but that's part of the disinformation. This was a, and when I say this, this individual couldn't have been more than 21, 22 years old. Like, and so they're getting their information from the internet. And so what we have to do is as an ally, you know, if you have, if you're an ally, when you hear things like that, it's a confronted, you need to say, well, no, Trans people are people, and we don't stop people from doing the things that everyone else does. 
And, and so that is where I think that sometimes allyship, where people say, well, no, that's my friend. They don't mean it. That's my family. They don't mean it. That's my colleague. They don't mean it. But you can't be a full ally if you're not confronting it and saying, well, no, because now you've dehumanized an entire group of people. And so for me, that's what it is. Thank you, Brent. And then last but not least, Imara. Yeah, I would say really quickly, um, if you're talking about trans people or you are making policies or decisions that could affect trans people and there are no trans people in the room or around the table, there's something fundamentally wrong, right? And then I think that the degree to which we can fold trans people into um, the core of our decision making when there are considerations that are either directly or about or which could impact or affect um, trans people's lives, that it would make a huge difference. Thank you so much, all of you, um, each of you, Imara, Jasmine, Kiara, and Brent, um, for taking the time to discuss these issues together and and each of the, the important things that you all are working on or are agitating for. I think this has been a very informative and inspiring conversation. I'm very mindful of time. And um, unfortunately, I don't think that we have time to do Q&A, but I see a lot of people have been putting their questions in the chat and have been getting answers from our panelists who have been doing amazing work of double duty between answering these very thought-provoking questions and also getting back to people. But I also encourage people to email us at the Commission on Gender Equity um, at genderequity at cityhall.nyc.gov. Um, if you have further questions or want to try to connect with some of our panelists today, we are very happy to facilitate that. And we very much appreciate you all joining us today for this event. Um, before we end, we did want to take a moment to um, share some relevant New York City government resources for trans and gender expansive New Yorkers, including gender affirming health services, LGBTQ plus specific resources, and supports if you or someone you know has experienced gender based violence. Um, the slide that's being shown now includes links to those resources, and we will definitely be emailing this to all of the attendees via email afterwards. So um, don't worry about trying to you know, write all of this down. You can also learn more about the New York City 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence campaign and other upcoming events that are part of the campaign at www.nyc.gov slash 16 days. And, you know, I just want to say again, one more time, thank you so much to our panelists today for sharing their thoughts and perspectives. I think people have learned a lot. I've seen a lot of engagement throughout the, um, throughout the event of people, you know, clapping their hands. And I think you've really taught us so much today about, about, you know, thinking more critically about the world around us, the institutions that we we use and the, the things that we hear and how we need to, as Kiara said, you know, decolonize our minds and be very mindful about um, what people are, are saying to us and and recognizing that we each have a role to play in com in addressing violence against trans and gender expansive communities, because I think, as so many of you have pointed out, violence against those members of our community is violence against us all, and we all suffer. So thank you so much again, and um, really appreciate um, you all taking the time and being with us today. And for that, um, we'll, we'll end there. Thank you all so much again. <laughs>